Welcome to How Is God Calling You? A production of CTNY, the Catholic television network of Youngstown. It is a show that seeks to stimulate and assist youth and young adults to discover the path that God has chosen for them. Locations to the priesthood, religious life, marriage, and single life will all be discussed. Your program host is Father James Corda. Hello and welcome to this edition of How Is God Calling You? Today we're going to talk with the Ursuline Sisters of Youngstown. And joining me in today's show is Sister Mary McCormick. And Sister Mary, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show today. Well, thank you. I'm delighted to be here. You know, in our first segment, we'd like to talk in general about vocations and how does one know that they have a vocation, what a vocation's all about. I think I'd like us to focus on how does someone know that they have a vocation to religious life as opposed to a career or a job. How does one really know that? Sure. Uh, I think for young people, and today, of course, when you're talking about young people, you're talking about everybody from high school students to young adults all the way up to the age of 40. Uh, there's a long process that they go through about determining what they want to do with life. Part of it does uh, involve kind of trying to figure out what you're good at, uh, the kinds of things that are suited to you and to your personality. And I think combined with that is a sense of where's God in your life. And so a vocation really comes not so much out of what job you're good at, but how God is calling you in your life. Um, in the church, we believe that there are many vocations, uh, the vocation to priesthood, to religious life, to the permanent diaconate, to married life, to parenthood. And I think people really need to focus on how God is active in their lives and kind of combine that with some of the gifts and talents that, they're, that they have naturally. I like the line that you said, um, we look for something that we're good at. You mm -hmm. know, and, and I think that's so important in, especially in responding to a vocation because so many people are very unhappy with the, the work or the career that they've chosen in life right. and for some reason are kind of stuck in it. Why is it so important to, to really like being a sister or being a priest? What, what is that all about and how important is that component? Well, I think it's a, a vital component uh, for anybody who's choosing the consecrated life or the priesthood. Uh, first of all, the whole point of that kind of life is to uh, serve God and God's people. And at the heart of that ought to be a, a, a certain joy that comes with living the gospel life and a certain happiness about life in general. And so I think what a person does in trying to discern a vocation is really try to say, how can I be of help to God and God's people? How can I be uh, an ambassador of the gospel? And is this going to make me happy? You know, uh, in the old days when people would look at the Baltimore Catechism, that was one of the first questions. God made us so that we could be happy, first in this life and then ultimately with him in heaven. And I think sometimes people forget that happiness is really at the core of living a, a good Christian life. You know, and sometimes people have a misconception that I have to be a certain way or I have to um, uh, know everything that there is to know about being Catholic or I've had to read the Bible from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. And that's what uh, will help me become a better sister or, or respond to the call. But it's not necessarily fitting into a particular category that you respond to a call. How do we kind of dispel that myth that we have to fit into this category in order to be a sister or a priest? Yeah, I think I'd start with some of the basic uh, beliefs that we have as a Christian community about who we are. Uh, already we're made in God's image and likeness. Already God has gifted us with many things. And when God calls any particular person, any uh, high school student, any college student, any young adult, uh, God calls them with the gifts and talents that they have. So God's not looking that we all fit some preconceived mode. Rather, God takes each person as they are with the gifts and talents they've been given and with whatever kind of likes they have and says, here's the person that I want to help proclaim the good news uh, for this time in history. And what about that whole sense of uh, the call to holiness? Some people don't feel holy enough or feel worthy enough. How do we kind of assuage that feeling that they might have in trying to respond to that call? That is one of the things that I think has been a new emphasis in the church, especially since the Second Vatican Council. One of the central documents of the Second Vatican Council uh, was a document on the church. And as the church 
put that together, the Council Fathers put that together, right in the center of the document is a chapter that's, in call, that's entitled uh, The Call to Holiness. And it reminds us that everybody's called to holiness. And part of that holiness, I think, is linked to happiness. That we really will be happy in life. We'll be happy with our life circumstances, with our job, with uh, our relationships, to the extent that we also try to be holy. And sometimes I think that holiness, uh, we had a, an image of it that it's, I have to be set apart, I have to be different. Um, if we think about who God is, you know, the very nature of God for us Christians is a God is triune. There's this unity of people. Uh, the best way we live out holiness, I think, is in that unity of persons. And so it's in and through our relationships. Sometimes, for many people, if their vocation is marriage and parenthood, those relations are with their spouse, with their children, with their in-laws. Uh, but for people who are consecrated religious or priests, the holiness is with uh, the members of their parish, their religious community, uh, and the people with whom they live and work. That holiness is lived out in relation. What about a support system that someone, I think, needs in order to respond to the call? Um, whether it's a, a parental approval or a peer approval, how important is that? Because let's, let's face it, there are probably parents out there who actually don't want their son or daughter to enter religious sure. life. H how do we kind of talk about that whole situation that's, I think, a reality? It is a reality. And um, as you mentioned, we all need a support system. Um, let me contrast it again for somebody who chooses marriage. When someone chooses marriage, you kind of have a built-in support system in that uh, your spouse is part of your support system and then your children are part of your support system as well. For someone who chooses priesthood or religious life, ideally family is also supportive and friends are also supportive. But a religious community is going to be supportive, uh, a diocese is going to be supportive, um, and the community of faith, that larger community of faith is also going to be supportive. One of the fears I think that parents have is that um, a son or a daughter who's thinking about religious life or the priesthood will not be happy. And that's one of their fears. I think if they can see their their children happy, that's going to allay many of those fears. And even if they're not initially supportive, I think they might eventually come to uh, support the choice that they've made. The other thing is, both for consecrated life and for priesthood, um, the church builds in a long process. When one expresses an interest, it doesn't mean that's the, the direction I'm going on forever. Uh, someone who goes to the seminary has a long period of time before ordination. Someone who enters consecrated life equally has a long period of time before they get to the point of final vows. So there's a long period when somebody can say, yes, this is for me, or no, this isn't for me. And it's during that time that I think that support can, can grow among family and friends. Why don't we talk a little bit more about that whole process that I think we would term discernment. And there's obviously very steps, various steps that we need to take. Um, why is that discernment process so important and imperative to responding to the call? Because it's not something we do lightly, or it's not something exactly. we do overnight. So how important is that, and what are some of those steps that we take for discerning? Um, first of all, let me talk a little bit about discernment. The whole concept of discernment is trying to um, make choices and make decisions often about two goods, because I think in this case we're talking about between two goods or three goods, uh, sometimes between good and evil, sometimes between two evils. Uh, so there are a variety of ways that one can make a discernment. And a discernment is a process by which we try to identify, here's where I think God is calling me in light of the gifts and talents that, that have been given to me. When you think about a discernment to religious life, for example. I think you start that discernment with a sense of uh, there's kind of an inward attraction, uh, an attraction to serving God's people, to living a life of faith, to uh, kind of being involved in the church. That's kind of the first inclination. The second comes with, you know, I think I might want to do it with this group of people. These people seem to do it well these people seem to uh, really make a difference in people's lives. These people eh, seem happy, you know? So that's kind of a, a second part of it. And then I think there are some parallels between 
dating someone and the kind of discernment that one might go through for religious life. Not exactly the same, but there are some parallels. There's a little bit of a getting to know you time. You know, the getting to know you time is you hang out with them. You do some things with them. You engage in the ministries they're engaged in. You join them in prayer. If there's still a sense of, gosh, I like this way of life. I like these people. Uh, you know, and it's not just an initial, I'm going to do this. But uh, as I hang out with them, I, I like it a little bit more. You might get more deeply involved. You use the phrase um, getting to know you. And, and that would be, I think, almost a two-way street, uh, getting to know the individual in who is responding to this call, but them getting to know themselves as to uh, who they are, why is God calling me at this particular time in my life? How, how do you help someone get more in touch with what's going on inside? You're exactly right. Uh, it is always a two-way process. The person gets to know the religious community better and the person gets to know themselves better, uh, themselves better. And that's a really important part of it. Uh, I always say to young people if they're interested in religious life or if they're interested in priesthood, and especially even in our first conversation, one of the things I always say is, as you engage in this, you're going to find out more and more about yourself. And there's going to be a depth that you find about yourself. Uh, sometimes in our culture, we don't emphasize that depth dimension very well. But anyone who's pursuing religious life or priesthood, they're also going to have to get in touch with that depth dimension. And that's always a good thing. And no matter what choice the person makes, the more they come to know uh, the depth of their inner self, the more they're going to be able to, to be happy in life. We're down to the last two minutes before we take a break. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want to end on a negative note, but what if someone uh, is in this discernment process and, and maybe actually takes the step and becomes uh, a priest or a sister, and then at some point decides, this isn't where God is calling me. Is that our right at that point to make another decision? Certainly, I think that has happened. And we've seen it, I think, more frequently uh, since the Second Vatican Council than we did before. Uh, but I think, you know, we're living a longer lifespan now, and sometimes God can give a second call. And uh, people end up saying, this did fit me for a while, and maybe now it doesn't. Though there is a permanency that comes with final vows uh, and ordination, and I don't want to undermine that permanency, uh, sometimes people have gotten into it and then said, my life has taken a different direction or something else has happened and maybe I need to rethink uh, the commitment that I made. And uh, before we take a break, I think I'd like us to go back and start with um, those who made the decision later on in life uh, mm -hmm. to enter religious life or priesthood. And so we're going to talk about that in a moment. Okay, great. Stay with us. We'll be right back. I am Marino. Je suis Marino. I am Marino. I believe that we are all connected to each other, and that it is the gift of compassion that unites us and makes us one. It doesn't matter what language, culture, or tradition we come from. We can share compassion wherever we are. Marino, an American Catholic organization of priests and brothers, has been reaching out to those in need for nearly 100 years in 26 countries throughout the world. Marino dedicates 86 cents of every dollar donated to their programs, and with your help, they can do more. Missionaries, workers, volunteers, supporters, we are all Marino. I am Marino. Yo soy Marino. I'm Father Mike, and I am Marino. 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 Welcome back to our show, How Is God Calling You? We're talking with Sister Mary McCormick of the Ursuline Sisters of Youngstown. Before we went to a break, we, we talked about you know, someone who enters religious life or, or priesthood and then at some point decides it's not for them. Uh, but there are those that are entering, at least now, later on in life, almost as a second career. Right. How has that been your experience with some of the women in your community? We have seen it in our community. And uh, I think there are a variety of factors that lead to that decision. Uh, one is people are living longer.